The world of CEDH or Competitive Commander can be a dark and scary place to a lot of more casual EDH playgroups. Horror stories of turn 2 wins and infinite combos abound make it sound like an oppressive and unfun environment to many more casual players. But in truth, the format is nothing like that. Just like standard players at a Magic Fest are playing the most competitive standard decks, CEDH players are just playing the most powerful versions of your favourite commander. So if you're looking to upgrade your deck building game, I think there's some very powerful lessons from CEDH that we can apply to our own more casual EDH decks even if we're not quite interested in getting to quite the same power level as CEDHs. If there's one misconception I hear all the time from commander players, it's that their decks aren't powerful enough because they just can't afford the best cards for their deck. I mean, look at those CEDH deck lists. Those deck lists run in the thousands of dollars and they're the most powerful decks in the format, so price must have something to do with power level, right? Well, that is true to an extent, but it's not the whole picture. Most of the high cost in CEDH decks can be attributed to the incredibly high price tags of just a handful of cards. In this video, I'm going to show you six methods inspired by CEDH deck construction that you can use to make your decks a lot stronger without having to spend a fortune. But just before we get into that, I do have two things to say. The first is a disclaimer. I am not a CEDH player. The advice I present here is based on a great deal of consumed content from YouTube channels like The Spike Feeders, Playing With Power, Casually Competitive, and recently West Coast CEDH, as well as a lot of reading and analyzing of threads and deck lists posted to the internet. As a result, I would call this video well researched, but it's not necessarily based on my first hand experience. The second is an algorithmically beneficial call to action. According to YouTube viewing data, putting a call to action encouraging your viewers to subscribe or engage with your content just after the hook of your video but before the main content is the best way to grow as a channel. In all seriousness though, we are edging ever closer to the 1000 subscriber mark, which is a statement I'd like to really be able to look back on and laugh. So if this video has been helpful to you or informative or entertaining in any way, please do consider subscribing so that you can see more videos like this one in the future. Anyway, on with those six deck building strategies. The first is considering your win conditions. Deck strength is primarily measured by your ability to win with it, right? So if you're looking to make your deck stronger, then you need to think carefully about how your deck plans on doing that. In CEDH, the majority of wins are two or three card combos, which not everybody likes, but they are the easiest ways to close out the game. Plus, they don't necessarily have to be expensive. As I record this video, Sushi Hulk or Fish Hulk is the king of CDH, and that whole combo comes to less than $10. I'll probably make a video all about the different combos that are worth looking at in EDH, and when I do, I'll link to it here, but for now I'll just say that it's definitely worth your while to look into them if you and your playgroup is all right with their use. But maybe you'd rather avoid combos for whatever reason. A lot of playgroups don't like them, and while there's definitely a discussion to be had there, it's not one for this video. So, okay, infinite combos are out, well your deck still needs to win somehow and you need to make sure you're aware of what exactly your deck strategy is. Combat damage is likely the most popular one, but how are you going to ensure that your creatures can get through and deal lethal damage? You've got targeted removal, counter spells, board wipes, blockers and life gain all as potential hurdles to consider. There are ways of dealing with these of course, but you're going to have to consider them all and make sure your deck can handle whatever obstacles are put in your creatures ways. Another way people quite enjoy winning is through big X spells like Hurricane or Torment of Hailfire. Well, in these cases your biggest questions are, how do I generate all this mana? How do I make sure they will definitely kill my opponents, in the case of life gain for example? And how do I make sure these spells resolve? Lastly, there are a lot of alternative win condition cards that you can try to use. The if you would draw a card while you have an empty library you win the game effects of Laboratory Maniac, Thassa's Oracle and Jace Wielder of Mysteries are staples of the CEDH scene where they're typically coupled with a card that can mill out your entire deck like do you want a consultation or doomsday. But maybe you want to try playing them in a less combo centric way. Perhaps you'll mill yourself out or draw enough cards that you can empty your deck over the course of the game. Maybe you want to win with Happily Ever After or Barren Glory or even just the Biogenesis effect that's on Shaman of Forgotten Ways. Just whatever it is you need to be aware of how you want your deck to win if you want it to win more often because that should be what guides you throughout the deck building process. Dumping a bunch of your favourite cards into your deck and calling it a day is definitely a fun way to play the game, but it's not what you want to be doing if you're looking to win often. Now, with your win condition in mind, the rest of your deck, including your commander, simply exists to help you set up that win condition. And a quick note here, this is why two or three card combos are so strong. Not because they're inherently broken or anything, but more because a two card combo that wins the game gives you 98 slots that you can fill with cards that help you pull off your win. 
If your win condition is combat damage, you're going to need a bunch of creatures and all that removal and protection necessary to let those creatures get through multiple times. That gives you a lot less room to work with in your deck construction, but if that is the kind of game you want to play, that's totally fine and I'm not saying you should change, just pointing out the deck building constraints that we're working with as a result of that decision. All right, second is about fast mana. Whatever your deck is trying to do, you want to be doing it before everyone else is doing whatever it is their deck wants to be doing. And speed in magic is primarily determined by how much mana you have available to you. The more mana you have, the more stuff you can do. You might think that spending your early turns ramping up your mana is something unique to casual games of EDH, while CEDH players are too busy comboing off on turn one or something. But looking at CDH decklist reveals that most CDH decks have around 48 cards that either produce mana or ramp. That's around half of the deck that's wholly concerned with mana production. And why? Well, think about the games of Commander you've had, where someone's turn one was Sol Ring into a Signet. Immediately, that player is so much further ahead than everyone else. Assuming everyone else just plays a land and passes, when it gets to their turn two, if they have an untapped land in hand, they're going to have access to more mana than everyone else at the table put together. But we don't want to just rely on Sol Ring draws if we want our deck to win more consistently. We need to make sure our deck has a lot of mana rocks and enough lands. Following the example of CEDH, a good template would be to have at least 30 lands and about 15 non-land cards like mana rocks, mana docks, or ramp spells. So let's talk about your land base in a little more detail. Lands are one of the most important and yet least exciting elements of your deck building, and it doesn't help that the best lands cost a very pretty penny and have a large but also largely hidden impact on the performance of your deck. While there is some debate about how big of an impact tap lands have on your deck's performance, it's fairly obvious that if you could freely choose between tap lands and untapped lands, the untapped land would be the better choice. So what can we take from that? Well, for budget conscious players, I'd say that you don't ever want a land to come in tapped unless there's a really good reason for it. And how good the reason is changes with the budget and requirements of your deck. In a monocolor deck, you can rely very heavily on basics, and there's not that many non-basics that you'd even want to put in your deck. Basics are actually fantastic, and they're severely underrated in Commander generally. There's a lot of effects that basics dodge, like Blood Moon and Wasteland, and they always come in untapped, which is just so good. For a two-color deck, I'd really recommend trying to run no tapped dual lands. They're just not that necessary. There's plenty of cycles of cheap two-colored lands that don't come in tapped, like the Pain lands, Fast lands, Check lands, Shadow lands, Filter lands, and more, but the prices of these can fluctuate depending on deck popularities and reprints, so just always be on the lookout for cheap dual lands. Other than that, two color decks can rely on basics quite a bit too. As long as you're not trying to cast cards like Golgari Find Broker on turn four consistently, a land base of primarily basics rounded out with appropriate mana rocks can keep you covered while never really having to sacrifice on temple. For decks with three colors or more on a budget, tapped lands become a necessity. And this is where the biggest hit to the power level of your deck will come from if you want to play a three, four or five color decks without splashing out on your mana base. Remember that a tap land doesn't just cost you tempo in the turn that you play it, but also cumulatively throughout the game. That tap land that you played on turn two, if it wasn't a tap land, it could have helped you cast a card that ramped you ahead, but now that it is a tap land, you have to wait until turn three, and that means that you're giving it what you would have cast on turn three as well, which will have to wait until turn four, so on and so on. If you aren't willing to shell out on lands, you are going to have to accept the tempo hit as a trade-off for being able to play cards of more colors. Or you can risk relying more heavily on basics, which can be fine depending on how strict the color requirements of your deck are, but this might make your deck a lot less consistent. That said, if your deck is base green, you can use a lot of basic lands, untapped jewels, and green ramp spells to pull out whatever colors of money you need, because the green ramp spells tend to be quite cheap. All right, the fourth strategy concerns Tudors. One of the big reasons that CDH decks can afford to run so many lands and mana rocks is because they benefit from the added consistency of Tudor effects rather than having to rely on the top of your deck. With half of the cards in your deck producing mana, every draw gives you roughly a 50-50 chance at drawing gas. But if you put Tudors in your deck, that means that when you do draw into one, it's exactly the card that you need for that situation. However, Tudors are controversial in more casual circles. They lead to repetitive play patterns and they make all games look a little bit more homogenous. But that consistency is what leads to higher win rates. Again, this is going to come down to personal preference, but for the budget-minded player, there are a lot of Tudor options available at quite low price points. And the reason they're so cheap is usually because they're not the most straightforward or powerful tutors, which might make them more acceptable to your playgroup. I'll link to a list of 100 tutors that all cost $3 or less in the description below, and I'd recommend perusing it to see what you might be able to add to get that consistency up. 
All right, number five is card advantage. If you're not running cheaters, you're definitely going to want to have a good amount of card advantage at your disposal. And even if you are running cheaters, strong card advantage engines make your deck a lot more powerful by giving you more resources to either remove your opponent's problematic permanents or burn through their own removal. Card advantage comes in many forms and how many slots you dedicate to it should largely be determined by your choice of commander. A commander like the Gitrog monster or Muldraw through the Gravetide has a built-in card advantage engine meaning you should only be dedicating a few slots to additional card advantage sources like draw spells. But if your commander doesn't provide much card advantage, you'll want to make sure your deck is packed full of it. Ultimately, Magic is a game about resource management, and while it's all good and well to have a lot of mana, it's not much use if it sits there untapped. You need things to do with it. Last but not least is protection. One of the biggest hurdles for many players is not actually how many cards they have in hand or on the board, but rather how they use them. And it's for this reason I call the last category of cards in your deck protection rather than the more typical interaction. Because good player means using your interactive cards not just to change the board state, but rather to protect yourself and your win condition. For example, let's say you're playing a Demonic Consultation in Thassa's Oracle deck. All you need to do to win the game is have both of these cards resolve without anyone else interrupting them. As a result, whether your opponent has a huge board presence or not is largely irrelevant. How many cards the Muldrotha player has in their graveyard doesn't matter. So using up all your counter spells to stop big creatures from hitting the board or to counter a dead bridge chant is a bit of a waste if it means you can't stop someone from countering your Thassa's Oracle. If the big creatures aren't coming at you, there's no reason to remove them. And this applies to other strategies too, not just the combo lines. A lot of the time we focus too much on what everyone else is doing and not enough on ensuring our own game plan goes off without a hitch. So pack protection and make sure to use it well. Protection comes in different shapes and sizes, from board wipes to counter spells to targeted removal to even just spells like Veil of Summer or lands like Besage You Who Shelters All. Just make sure that you use it wisely and always be considering whether you might need this piece of protection later for when you plan to win the game. So that's six deck building tips that you should keep in mind when constructing your EDH deck for optimal success. But to summarize those points quickly, one, Choose a win condition and keep it in mind throughout the deck building process. Two, load your deck with ways of producing mana. About half of your deck should be concerned with mana production. 30 lands and 15 non-land ramp spells is a good baseline. Three, try and create a fast and consistent mana base. That means as few tap lands as possible. Rely on basics if your deck doesn't have strict color requirements. They're a lot better than you might think. Four, use tutors to increase the consistency of your deck. They don't have to be expensive and they don't have to be boring either. Five, determine how much your deck needs card advantage engines based on the commander that you're running. You never want to be in a position where you're sat on a lot of mana and nothing to do with it. Six, always use protection. Fill up the remaining slots in your deck with interaction that is as flexible and cheap on mana as possible and try to use it to either protect yourself from imminent doom or to stop your win condition from being shut down. So that's all the advice that I have for this video. These were six lessons that we can take from CEDH and apply to our more casual EDH deck building to try and increase the power level of our decks. It is worth saying that when it comes to power level, this is always a conversation you need to have with your player group. There's no point in trying to soup up the power level of your deck if your player group is just playing at a lower power level. You're just going to stomp them and it's not going to be fun for anyone. I mean, that's not entirely true. It might be fun for you, but it won't be fun for them and it's a good way to lose friends. So just don't do it, you know? But that's it for this video, so uh, thank you very much for watching, and as I said, please do consider subscribing if you have found this content uh, useful or entertaining or informative in any way. It really helps me out. Uh, we're getting close to that 1000 subscriber mark, and that would be really cool uh, to be able to get there and remember those days of, th those three digit days, try and leave those behind in the past. Also, I'm really interested to hear what your feedback is on this video. I read all of my comments and try and act upon them, uh, but I'm also going to try asking a question in this video and seeing what kind of responses we get. We touched on card advantage engines in this video, but I didn't specify any ones in particular. So my question is, what's your favorite card advantage engine? Uh, I recently bought a copy of Rhystic Study and Mystic Uramora, and it makes me giddy like a child when I get to cast those spells. You just draw so many cards. It's very fun. I know it's very unfair, uh, but they're just very good cards. But what's your favorite? I think Guardian Project is another one that comes to mind. Or The Great Henge. What's your favorite? But that is all from me. Uh, until next time, have a great day, and uh, hope all goes well for you.